Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Since the 2010 U.S. Census, the state of Missouri has had eight congressional districts. Of those eight, six are held by Republicans and two held by Democrats. Emanuel Cleaver, representing Kansas City area, and Lacey Clay, representing St. Louis City and much of North St. Louis County. Mr. Clay is a 2014 candidate for re-election, seeking his eighth term of office. Our guest today, Martin Baker, wants Mr. Clay's job. But first, Mr. Baker must successfully get through a three-way August 5th Republican Party primary. After that, he expects to win the November 4th general election. Martin Baker was born and raised in Sykeston, Missouri. His interest in political path began during his studies at the University of Missouri, Columbia. He majored in political science and criminal justice. He was elected a student senator. By 2007, Mr. Martin was selected as, I'm sorry, it's Mr. Baker, uh, was selected as a delegate to the National Black Republican Association. Now he's a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives. Martin Baker, welcome to the conversation. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for having me. Okay, so um, um, let's just talk about you first of all. I did a little bit of bio, but you know, you said that you, uh, you told me you were born in Sykeston. Uh, just a little bit of background so people know something about you and uh, get to know you as a person. Thank you. My bio, like I said, it all started for me in Sykeston, Missouri, which is about two and a half hours south of St. Louis. A little southeast Missouri town. Rush Limbaugh likes to call that area the quintessential modern Midwestern area, and it truly is. There are some of the best people in the state in my hometown area. I was a proud graduate of Sykeston High School. I had a great, great amount of respect for the educators there. My, my family background is there. It's where it was instilled in me, the, the traditions, the values that are instilled in our great state. And it, where, it was the, the starting point for a lot of the points of my life and in my, in my career. And those values are the values that I want to bring to Washington because I think that we've had a distraction from those values that, that have made our country the, the, the best and last hope of freedom. It is the last beacon. What and do you mean by distractions, by the way? I, I believe the distractions that we've had is that we, we've strayed from truly the path that made us the republic that we are. I believe where we've had a, a government that is that has grown too large for itself. We have a society that has has strayed away from the traditions. When we have a society that, that started out with with faith and family that is now being raised by, by MTV, BET, and reality shows. These are the traditions and the values that we have forgotten and that we need to return to because those are the values that made our country what it is. You mentioned you had good schooling where you were. Um, in the district that you hope to represent, they have several school districts that are really falling pretty flat. Um, uh, I was. Uh, I heard you talking some statistics about the uh, the schools. I think you said there was somewhere around 535 school districts uh, in in Missouri. Correct. And that the North County schools that you would be representing are all in the lower third. Is that correct? That is correct. If you look at the if you look at those statewide statistics, there are there are a little bit under 600 school districts within the state of Missouri. Outside of the first congressional district, you have school districts like Lindbergh and Clayton. And those school districts are in the upper third of the rankings statewide. However, every school district within the, within the first congressional district, that would be St. Louis City, that'd be Riverview Gardens, that would be Hazelwood, that would be Normandy. Normandy. Districts such as that, those districts are all in the bottom third. In fact, sadly to say this, Riverview Gardens ranks in ab absolute in last place of those districts. Now see, I don't understand years ago, prior to the, prior to the, uh, the civil rights movement, 
black education was very important in the black community. I mean, it was, uh, it was the way up and out of there and that that was very, very important to all the moms and dads and grandmas that kids get a good education. What has changed that now in the black community, most of the black schools are in the lower third? What has happened is, is as I want to go back again to Sykeston, um, I was raised by, by a grandmother who was functionally illiterate. She could not read, she could not write, but she emphasized to myself and my brothers and my sisters the importance of education. We, we talked about this off camera where we talked about the importance of education that used to be there in the black community. But for whatever reason, we suddenly had a social disconnect where instead of the schools becoming a, a bastion or a vestige of education, they became basically a daycare for eight hours where a parent just basically dropped off their child and said, you're, you're their problem for the next eight hours. And they did, you, you lost where you had the interaction with the teachers, with the, with the parents and the teachers. The parent-teacher organizations used to really strongly emphasize interaction, getting involved, talking about the curriculum, where we've had now that social disconnect. And it all goes back to straying away from those basic values that we used to have within, within not just the black community, but in every community. Because we see that all over, not just in we see that statewide, where school districts that used to be the envy around of our of our neighboring states are now more of a of a joke. They're becoming a mockery, and and it's, it it is a sad disconnect because of the fact again, as I say, we are straying away from those values that were the most important thing. Well, why do you think that the parents of St. Louis City uh, and the and the St. Louis City public school system? the parents of, uh, of Riverview Gardens, of Normandy, and the other school districts that aren't doing well, why aren't they demanding that something be done so that their children are not in the bottom third? I, I think what's going on is that you have a situation, sadly to say at some point in time, that they have been so conditioned that they're, that they're content. It, when, you get into an, it, when you get into a situation of contentment where where you feel like, well, there's nothing really we can do. We, we, can, we can scream it to the rooftops, but nothing's being done. But the way that it could be done and should be done is being more involved, being not just vocal at a, at a school board meeting, but actually putting yourself up as a candidate and that school board, being more directly involved, not just talking about it, but actually getting involved. We need more involvement with the parents, and we need to keep those decisions local. Because when they're when they're allowing the the federal government to come in and just basically put a boilerplate of one size fits all education plan, whether it's Common Core, No Child Left Behind, or whatever the case may be, and and trying to make every district the same, there's where your problem is. I was going to ask you what your position would be on Common Core education, but I think you've already. You, you pretty well let people know. I believe, again, let me emphasize that. All education decisions need to be made local because I don't believe that the students in St. Louis City are the same as the students in Riverview Gardens or not the same as the, they are in Normandy or the name, they are anywhere else within the district. Unless you are planning on taking each of those students and shifting them around in every district, you're not going to have the same students every day. Mm -hmm. And no child, no two children at all learn the same way. And we need to understand that. We need to emphasize individual achievement. We need to emphasize individuality and, and allow for a child to grow and to learn and let it, do, let it be done locally. This is not one of these where everybody gets a trophy because they just showed up. We need to emphasize individual achievement. We need to emphasize reaching for the best, being the best that you can be, going above and beyond to achieve and accomplish a goal and making it beneficial for that goal to be done, making it worthwhile to say it's okay to challenge yourself, to push yourself to be better. As you go through your district knocking on doors, 
what do the people on the other side of the door say that they want the central issues of this campaign for Missouri One to be? I, I, and it, it's, I'm glad you asked that because the fact this is what we framed our, our campaign on. We, we focused our campaign on four key issues. First is, of course, respect for the United States Constitution. We're seeing so many times where the Constitution is being challenged, where it's being threatened, where, where the guarantees that the Constitution give us, things like life, liberty, the pursuit of our own individual happiness, they're being threatened every day in the courts, being threatened every day in our simplest society. So we have to remember to get back to those constitutional values. Mm -hmm. The second point that we, we've talked about is the respect for life. We, we see the crime statistics in the St. Louis area, and we see and these are not a pretty picture. People have forgotten the value of even the most simple of human lives. I'm proud that I am the only candidate in my race, both on either the Republican or the Democrat side, that is endorsed by Missouri Right to Life, which means that I will, strongly, strong, I will strongly stand for the defense of the, of the unborn, the preborn, whichever word you wish to use. And that, is, that doesn't just translate just to, to babies. I'll protect life at all costs, basically from womb to the tomb. That is the thing that we have to get back to those values. The thirdly, the third point is the belief in limited government. We, we've talked about that with education, but also on so many other areas. Our government has reached into areas that it never has had any business in and should not. The government should never be a competitor to private industry, should never be a competitor in the, in the business world because the government can always stack the deck in their favor and the government always will have its own steady stream of income as long as there are taxpayers. And finally, it's a belief in personal responsibility. We have to take ownership of our district. We have to take ownership of the things that are going on. We have to take ownership of our own liberty. We have to take ownership of our freedom. We have to do that because no one is going to just hand it to us. We have to get out of the era that we've come into, the era of free stuff. And remember going back to that era of freedom where we had civil rights workers who were literally getting beaten, who literally exchanged their lives so that I could sit here today as a candidate for the United States Congress. We have to have a, have a redirect to remember that the American dream still lives, that it is alive and well. I sit here today as living proof that the American dream is alive and well today in the first district. Mm -hmm. The uh, Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, has created considerable controversy in the United States. People are on one side or the other. In the black community, there seems to be generally um, favorable response to the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. What is your position and what would you be doing uh, uh, with Obamacare if you're elected to the United States House of Representatives. As I've always said, the Affordable Care Act is neither affordable nor that it does it provide care. But it is an act. It is an act of war on the American people, in my opinion. Because what the Affordable Care Act is that it does is it tells you about your insurance. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything to address the skyrocketing costs of health care. It doesn't do anything to address the needs of care. It doesn't do anything for the cure. It doesn't even do anything for the alleviation of the symptoms. What it does is it puts the government into the marketplace to gain another foothold in telling, a, telling an American citizen where to buy, where to buy, and who to buy it from. When you have that. Pause there for just a second. I would just want people to understand what you started saying is that the Affordable Care Act is not like a hospital or a doctor. It's an insurance program. That is correct. And a lot of people don't seem to understand that, that it is an insurance program that is replacing the free market insurance that we've had in this country uh, most of the 20th century. That is correct. And, and that is the one emphasis that I put on that to, to everyone that I talk to. It is not, through the tax dollars of the United States, we're not building hospitals. We're not building health clinics. We're not making the, the process, if you go into the ER or anything else, easier, more seamless. We're not addressing the symptoms. We're not using this money to cure cancer, to cure AIDS, to, to do any of those things. We are using that to put people, to pigeonhole them 
into an insurance system. That is all it is, that's all it ever will be. One of my first acts that I will do within my first 90 days within office, I'll be introducing legislation to move to repeal the Affordable Care Act. One of the beautiful things that our Supreme Court did, and a lot of people are very unhappy about this, is that when Chief Justice Roberts affirmed basically the Affordable Care Act, he did us actually a favor. Because what he did was, is that he, while doing so, he, said, he made it known as a tax. He made it as an appropriation. And what a lot of people don't understand in the Constitution of the United States is that any appropriations bill has to start in the House of Representatives. The Affordable Care Act started in the Senate. So now we have a disconnect right there. Again, the Senate taking over where the House should have been in an appropriations bill. Mm -hmm. So we can move to repeal that on that basis firstly. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let's move into taxes in general, not just the Affordable Care Act. What is your position on the current tax system that we have, the, the IRS, and all of the stacks and stacks of, of rules and regulations uh, compared to other ideas that have been put, put forward. You know, the, uh, among those would be fair tax. Also among them would be the kind where everybody just pays a certain percentage. Right. The Internal Revenue Service, I have always said this, and I will continue to say this before, is probably the most, the largest licensed criminal organization that we have in the United States of America. The only difference is, is that they have badges and, and the gangsters don't because they still have, you still have agents from the IRS who have guns who enforce their, their, their principles, their ideals. Well, the, this is law that they are uh, enforcing, right? Well, it is, a, it is truly a law. It, they, have, they, have, they have a constitutional amendment to back them on their premise to collect taxes. The history of that goes back 100 years ago. This was where, the, initially, the Internal Revenue Code was not truly, for the most part, not supposed to be a, a long-term thing. It was to help fund the war. It was to help to get us through the Depression, to get it where, where people put their fair share into it. However, what the Internal Revenue Code turned into is a, a weapon of retaliation that multiple administrations have used. Both Republicans and Democrats have used that to sort of keep their enemies at bay. Prime example, John F. Kennedy used to walk around with the, with the tax returns in the White House showing them off of some of the more affluent Americans. Bill Clinton used it to investigate organizations that did not agree with him. George W. Bush investigated the NAACP through the IRS. And now we have the whole debacle with, with the conservative Tea Party groups that are being investigated by the IRS. This is not something that the American people deserve, nor should they stand for. Yeah, My, one, of, one of the things that Nick, Richard Nixon, uh, one, of the, one of the bills of impeachment was about improper use of the IRS to go after his political enemies. Absolutely. And this is, this is not something that a president, a, a leader of the House of Representatives, the leader of the Senate, or any person should ever have access to. Tax codes are, as they stand right now, are there to, to collect revenue on behalf of the United States government, on behalf of the United States people, not to be used as a tool to bring people to heal, not to make them comply or to conform with whatever the current administration's will is. We have to abolish the Internal Revenue Code. We must take that, take that, that saber or take that, that arrow out of the quiver of the United States government. Well, how do you fund the government if you don't have a mechanism to tell people, yes, you will pay money? I am an, I am an advocate of what is, what is called House Resolution 25, which is the Fair Tax Act, which will abolish the Internal Revenue Code, which will, which will take out the constitutional amendment for, for the collecting of taxes through income, and it'll be done on a national sales tax for every new item that you, that you purchase. When you go out and you go buy that new car, there would be a national sales tax on that. When you go out and go buy that new house or that new boat, whatever the case may be, that will collect a sales tax on that. Well, that would fund the government. It wasn't that long ago that the national budget was something like $1 trillion. 
Now I think it's some, getting closer to four trillion dollars. But let's just say, let's just go back to the one trillion or two trillion. Um, is the fair tax going to be able, through this national sales tax, to be able to collect enough revenue in order to run the government? Absolutely it will, because here's what's going to happen. When you have a taxation where people are actually, everyone is putting, everyone likes to use the phrase skin in the game. By going out and buying that, you increase the buying power of the American dollar. You're going to have it where companies that are taking jobs offshore because of the regulations through the Internal Revenue Code, through the taxes, they're going to bring those jobs back home. You're going to have thousands of, of jobs repatriated to the United States. You have companies that are, I'll say it this way, that are hiding funds, hiding income, sheltering them right. in offshore accounts. They're going to bring that money back home as well. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to happen. If a person does not want to pay for a, a new item, they'll buy a used item. It, you, you, will, you will be the master of your own tax destiny by doing so. Is this sales tax on, on uh, that you mentioned only on new items? Is It'll be on, on new items, correct. On new items. On new items. Okay. Obviously, we would hope for certain things being exempted, such as food, such as medicine. This is where I would like to see some of those things. Mm -hmm. Also, what the fair tax will also do is it gives what's basically a prebate for up to any person with a valid Social Security number, a prebate up to the poverty level. So even persons who are less fortunate will still be able to have an opportunity to still contribute to that. Because this will, this will cut away the, the runaway spending. This will cut away the fraud, waste, and abuse. Those are the three main things that, that the IRS thrives on, fraud, waste, and abuse. Let me ask this there. now. Uh, you've been to many, many doors already, knocking on them in the district, asking for votes. Have you discussed this with the people on the other side of the door, and what has their response been to these proposals that you're making? When you ask them a simple question, how would it feel to have 100% of your paycheck, a lot of people are very favorable to that. Knowing that you're, that you're not going to have that 32% of embedded taxes that the federal government puts in there, that you're going to be able to have access to that money again, whether it's you want to take a vacation to Disney World with your family, or you want to just go downtown and go visit the Arch or catch a Cardinals or a Rams game. You're going to have that added, that added spending power to do so. Knowing that the federal government is not in your pocket in that way, and you are the one that decides what your taxes are going to be, is a very favorable message. Okay. We have the, it's just the way we frame the discussion. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the, here, now we're going to give you a loaded question. What is it that Lacey Clay should be doing or is not doing that you object to enough to take the time out of your life to run for this political office? Let me start by saying I'm not going to go with a typical Republican response where that he's a Democrat, so I have to, I have to challenge him. That has been the problem that we've had in our society right now, is that we've made it an R versus D. John F. Kennedy said it best when he said, let's not seek the Republican answer or the Democrat answer. Let's seek the right answer. Mm -hmm. I personally, myself, look at Congressman Clay as my representative. I pray for him I, as I pray for our nation. I pray that he would be a responsible steward of the vote of the, of the people of our district, not just the Democratic people, not just the Republican people, but for every person in the district. This is where Congressman Clay and I, I have a disconnect. I disagree with him on his method, his approach. I feel that that he has had a had an absolute disconnect on certain areas with certain groups of, of people. Like prime example, where during the IRS hearing with the missing emails that Congressman Clay was was absent during that hearing. During the Benghazi hearings, where when the when the mother of one of the of one of the four American citizens who gave their lives in defense of the embassy, Congressman Clay along with others walked out of that hearing. These are not that's not conduct befitting of an elected representative of the American people. Uh, that is not befitting of the person that I would call my representative. So a change must be made. A, a new era must come in with new ideas, 
with a new challenge, a new charge, a new freedom to bring that to bear. Mm -hmm. Here in the last three minutes or so, um, I'm going to give you the opportunity just to say the things that I, I haven't asked you, you know, about, but you wanted to make sure that people heard you talk about. Is there anything that, that is really important that you want people to know right now in the next three minutes? The most important thing that I can tell to the people of our district, and, I, and I'm speaking to them, is that the American dream is still real. It is still very much alive. The time is now for us to embrace our destiny in our district. There was a point where 40% of all the income that was generated in the state of Missouri went through the St. Louis area. That time can happen again. We have to take personal responsibility. We have to take ownership of our district. Together, each one of us can bring to bear through our faith, through our determination, and most importantly, through our hard work, through making the choices that sometimes may seem tough, but in the long run will give us the best boost that we can to once again to become the gateway to the West. I ask humbly to be your representative in Washington because I can promise you that no, at no point in time will I ever forget who sent me there. It won't be just the Republicans that are sending me there. It won't be just the Democrats. It will be the people of the 1st Congressional District. I am here for you and I will fight for you no matter what. Well said. Thank you very much. We have put on the screen um, uh, contact for, uh, for you and your organization. I gather people can go to, the, to a website. Yes, they can. And uh, if they want to help you to go door to door or to get signs. Yes, they can. And we look forward to that. We always like to say, and I, I, I have to give a bit of a shout out to my team. I have some of the, some of the greatest volunteers, whether it's Becky Noble, my, my campaign manager, whether it's Nick Sims, my, my, my campaign assistant, Ben Keithley. I, I have a team that I just, I can't say enough about them. Every one of them are, are some of the best people who are taking time out of their life. They are, they're, they're, they're the best unpaid team that I have ever had, and I am so grateful, and we are always looking for new people to join with us. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad that, I'm really glad that you, you've had the opportunity to come and speak and talk to, uh, to folks. Uh, I, I just want to assure you that uh, very soon we're going to uh, put this up on YouTube as well, so that if they're not seeing this on Charter, it will be entirely possible for them to go to uh, YouTube and show this, uh, show what you had to say um, uh, to their friends and to, uh, to other voters. And, and I, I hope that everyone will take advantage of that. It, it's an opportunity for us to see, because many years people have said that they don't have an alternative. They don't have a, an, a, an alternate view. You do now. Thank you very, very much for being with Thank us. Thank you. Uh, you've been listening to uh, Martin Baker. He is a Republican candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives, the 1st District. This is the district which is currently being represented by Lacey Clay. Uh, Mr. Baker would very much like to replace him. Thank you very much. And as I said earlier, this program will be on YouTube. Show it to your friends. We'll see you next time. Thank you. I'm Lee Presser.